Hey, welcome to our online worship. I'm glad you've joined with us. In just a few moments, you're going to hear Pastor Ryan preach a wonderful sermon, a wonderful teaching about what it means to love one another. So look forward to that. Throughout our time together today, I'll invite you to sing along with the songs. You'll see the words across the bottom of the screen. You'll hear our prayer prayed over us. And through all of this today, I pray that your heart is drawn together. Yeah, this is a crazy season when we can't be in person. But praise God that the Spirit of God joins us together, even as we worship separately apart from each other. I'm glad that you've joined with us today. There's so much going on in the life of the orchard. I'd encourage you to check out our website. Look to our social media, engage with us. Send along prayer requests, info at orchardnh.org, info at orchardnh.org, and we will be praying for you. Just a couple of quick reminders. The pizza with the pastor that was scheduled for January 16th has been moved to February 13th at 1215 p.m. So if you're new to the life of the orchard, maybe you've been an online viewer and yet have not come and been in person. What a great opportunity for you to come and get better acquainted with, with the leadership of the orchard on that day, February 13th. And the adult singles gathering that was set uh, for a meeting in January has also been bumped into February, February 20th at 1 p.m. An adult singles gathering, February 20th at 1 p.m. Now I invite you again. Let us know that you're with us. Put your name in the chat box. Let us know that you're here. Let us hear your prayer requests. Type them in. We'll be praying for you. As we enter into worship now, hear this prayer as we ask our Father to join us. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for Jesus our Lord and for you, Holy Spirit, poured out over us poured into us. And Spirit, you have been given to us to teach us, to empower us, to equip us for worship. Do that now. As we sing songs together, as we hear your word read and taught, as we receive from you all that you desire for us. And Father, we pray that you would do this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Faithfulness, O oh God, you wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart.
Hello, loved ones. So grateful to be back here and to be able to share worship with you. And we're glad that you joined us uh, in online worship. And we continue our study of Orchard Roots. This is the theme, the message of the next several weeks. We'll be grounding ourselves and rooting ourselves in Christ as a family, as a community. And we want you to entertain this question with us because you are all 
if you are in Christ and you're part of the Orchard community, you're all co-owners and partners in this endeavor. And here's the question. How do we become a community rooted in Jesus Christ? Pastor Ken, myself, the session, the staff, we're all desiring and praying that our community would be rooted and exemplary in Christ, representing Jesus to our neighbors and growing and learning from him each day. What is Orchard Roots? You've heard this said last week, and I'll repeat it. You'll probably hear it repeated uh, each week. Orchard Roots is an extended spiritual family led by ordinary people who live together in everyday gospel community and own the mission of Jesus in a network of relationships. And we base our efforts on what Paul writes to the church at Colossae in chapter 2. He says in verse 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So that theme is going to continue week over week. And today, we are to focus on the new commandment Jesus gave to his disciples in the upper room. And this new commandment lives in us and is to guide us and is our marching orders. And that is loving one another. I'm going to turn to God's word and we're going to turn to two verses in the Gospel of John chapter 13. Verses 34 and 35, Jesus says to his disciples, in the midst of the upper room, he just washed their feet, and just before he predicts, predicts his betrayal and denial, he says to them, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Loved ones, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, Father, help us to lift high the cross the love of Christ proclaim till all the world will adore his sacred name. Amen. So I have to tell you about my new year so far. Day one of my work day on January 3rd and my day has been barraged with meetings. And so much so that I have uh, meetings stacked up on top of each other. Um, to put it in one way, it's one o'clock in the afternoon on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, and I have four meetings scheduled at the same time. And it goes from eight to five. I'm sure many of you in the work world have experienced things like that. Many conflicting priorities. And one word that I have so appreciated, perhaps at least in the last week, my favorite word in the English language is the word optional. When someone sends an invite to me, some, many times it says required. You need to be there. We want you there to learn about something that we need to do or uh, to influence the discussion or conversation. But I enjoy seeing the word optional because then it helps, make, helps me to make a good decision as to whether or not I should be there. And we do like options, don't we? Burger King, back 20-something years ago, said that you can have your food your way right away. And that's good corporate business to have options available if you're choosing clothing or buying a car or whatever. And frankly, it's relieving when you're going to a restaurant or establishment today and you forgot your face mask to see on the door that masks are optional. That's kind of a relief because I've done that a few times. And certainly when we get to the Bible, um, there's lots of Old Testament regulations and ceremonial laws that are uh, now no longer in effect. And what was mandatory back then was that we could not eat products, pork products, <laughs> meat from hooved creatures. But now, 
<laughs> in the new covenant, you're allowed to eat bacon. And so therefore, it's optional. I like that. We like options. But there are certain laws in the Old Testament that carry over into the New Testament that are upheld by Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus. And uh, the Ten Commandments being the moral laws. Only one God, no idols, honor God's name, remember the Sabbath day, honor your father and mother, no murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lying, no coveting. These are all laws that carry forward, that are mandatory. And we know in our experience that we are revulsed at the thought of, or even seeing on the news, someone being murdered. And we are revulsed by the thought of people cheating on one another or, you know, Barry Madoff making off with all sorts of people's retirement assets or even the petty thief who breaks glass to steal, steal something. And yet, I wonder to what degree does the church feel that loving one another is optional? You know, we, we, we build up these other commands, which are based out of love, by the way. <laughs> the Ten Commandments are loving God and loving neighbor, expressed in all ten of the commands. But I wonder to what degree Jesus' command in the upper room, how much do we view it as truly mandatory, as something we must do, as something that we're required to do? You know, we see it on are words that are used on Facebook, harsh words on the highway, gossip. And we make excuses, don't we? Oh, well, that person got under my skin, or they'll get over it. But loved ones, Jesus did not make loving one another optional. He says, this is my command, a new command that I give you to love one another. It's not a lighter command, but rather it's the melodic line of our relationships and the way we conduct ourselves. Donald Carson writes, the new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate. And it's profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. And he writes, it is the marching order for the newly gathered messianic community. The new commandment is a reiteration of the greatest commandment that even Jesus upheld saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you're to love your neighbor as yourself. And this new commandment is rooted and built upon the love that Jesus had for his disciples. He says that it's a new commandment because it's as I have loved you. Love is basic to the Christian character, says J.I. Packer. Francis Schaeffer says love is the mark of a Christian. Love is our language. Love is the t-shirt that we wear. Love is the logo that we wear on our hats. Paul calls love the belt that binds everything together in Colossians chapter 3. The compassion and patience and kindness and gentleness and forgiveness holds it all together that we are to wear the clothing of love. The last time I spoke here at the orchard was on Colossians 3. And I asked the question of all of you, are you wearing the clothing of Jesus? And that clothing is held together by love for one another. Love is our ethic and our core responsibility. One time in, uh, at my work, several years ago, I was proposing something to some senior executives. And one of them objected and said, Ryan, this is a non-starter. And uh, ultimately, I, uh, the other executives helped me win them over. But a non-starter in the church is not loving one another. John writes in one of his letters, he says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. You see, we forgive because we've been forgiven. 
We love because we have been shown love. We have compassion because we have been shown compassion. But John writes in that letter, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love God his brother. You see, we love God in following his commands and obedience and loving one another. And what does Jesus say? He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you are to love one another as I have loved you. Our love is to exemplify what Christ has done for us. In the beginning of chapter 13 in this passage, John writes about Jesus. He had always loved his own people in the world. Now he loved them right through to the end. Another way to translate that is right through to the goal or right through to the utmost. Jesus washed their feet. But ultimately, Jesus would pay the ultimate sacrifice for his people. He loved us so that we would be pardoned of our treason of our rebelliousness towards God, of our denying the truth. We would be pardoned and we would be cleansed of our faults. We would be freed and redeemed by Christ. We would be relieved and given peace with God and the wrath of God would be turned away and assuaged by the work of Christ on the cross who declared, it is finished. God demonstrates his own love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the love God and Christ has given us. And so our calling and his command to us is that as he has loved us, so we are to love each other. J.I. Packer writes this, The measure and test of love to God is wholehearted and unqualified obedience. So you love God by obeying his command. And what is the command that he gives us? To love one another. And so J.I. Packer continues, he said, The measure and test of love to our neighbors is laying down our lives for them. This sacrificial love involves giving, spending, and he says this, impoverishing ourselves up to the limit of, for their well-being. Have you ever thought of that? Impoverishing yourself for another person's well-being? Wow. We are told to love one another, and as part of the church, we are to foster unity among each other as well. Not only are we to give ourselves and commit commend other people and to give towards other people and to give ourselves and lay down our lives for others for greater love is none than this that a man lay down his life for his friends but also we are to let peace and unity be our ruler and umpire among the church and yes jesus is speaking to uh, a ragtag group of disciples here who come from various backgrounds. You have a zealot here, and you have a tax collector there, and you have a bunch of fishermen from a quote unquote blue collar background, and they're all different. They probably all had all their various opinions about Jewish life in Israel in the first century. And yet Jesus brought them together among their diversity and calls them to love one another. When Jesus gives this command, he's speaking to his disciples that he pulled from various places, a diverse group of individuals. Some were fishermen in a blue-collar setting. You had a zealot. You had a tax collector. And all of them came likely with their various opinions of life in first-century Israel. And they all probably got on each other's nerves. In fact, there's records of that, that they were annoyed when James and Peter and John asked Jesus the question about who would have uh, prominence in the kingdom of heaven. 
There's lots of chances where they were annoyed at each other, I imagine. And yet, yeah, I'm sure we all can get pretty annoyed with each other too. It can be hard to love one another. uh, And as we rub on each other, as we get close to one another, I mean, we're all within a close family setting over the Christmas holiday, many of you. And there might have been things that have pushed the limit (laughs) in your ability to love one another. And yet, the great hymn says that as a church, we are elect from every nation, yet one over all the earth. The church's charter of salvation is one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy holy name she blesses and partakes one holy food, and into one hope she presses with every grace endued. That we are one in unity and in peace, And yet it can be hard to show love and we can become lazy in showing love because our selfishness and self-centeredness can get in the way. Some of you may know I was in the hospital a couple months ago and I had a pretty serious condition. So when I first got in the hospital, I was pretty happy to be there. I was happy that I got admitted pretty quickly I remember being wheeled in, though, and I looked around as I was being wheeled in and saw stress on the part of the nurses and staff. They were just overrun. The place was filled in the emergency room. I saw uh, the face of a, of a mother standing over her child who was hooked up to tubes, and I saw the, the, the face of almost hopelessness And I, as I was wheeled in. And I just made it a point at, at that point, being conscious to say, I'm going... I'm going to go above and beyond to seek how to show how I can love every person who I come into contact with. Um, This is a chance to show Christ's love. So every every person getting my information, every nurse, every uh, doctor, the hospitalist, everybody, to 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 show love to them, to listen to them, to get their names, to hear about their families, to hear about their education, their background, how they got here and how they're doing and to ask how they're doing. And when they come into the room, I'd turn off the TV or put down the magazine. I was admitted into the ICU uh, for a period of time. And so, well, if you're in the ICU at the hospital I was at, it was like the (laughs) Ritz-Carlton, it was like Beverly Hills. If they could have had a spa and a swimming pool in the room and fit it in there, they probably would have. And so I I, I was showing kindness to people, but I didn't really get to enjoy all that because I was fairly immobile at that point. But as I got better, they realized that there was prioritization that needed to happen, so they bumped me down to uh, a lesser room, tighter quarters. You have a roommate, um, and the roommate, the roommate uh, w- actually pulled up my IV thing, and, and so it was very nerve-wracking, and the nurses were, were uh, spread thin a lot more in this, this special unit in the hospital that I got moved to. And it became harder. You know, when your patience is worn down, and you kind of want to get out of the hospital, it's a little bit harder to show love. The love meter <laughs> came down, but I prayed for help, and this is where this is what we are to do, is that we're not on our own here and coming up with our love for others. We have God who can help us. And so I did pray, Lord, help me to still reflect you here, to be your image bearer and showing the, the love of Christ and to care for the people who are here to help me and to help the, the people who are being my roommates and their, their family. How can I show you here? Because we're not on our own with this. Jesus didn't just set up a command for us and then we're on our own. He says later in, the, in John chapters 13 through 17, the upper room discourse, he, he shares how another counselor is coming and who will abide and live in us the Holy Spirit who will give us the ability to love. But we have to be rooted in Jesus and rooted in the Holy Spirit to be part of this Trinitarian love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have for each other is expressed in how we love one another, but we need to be rooted into the love of God. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to do just that. And loved ones, this love that Jesus commands us to bring and to be and to express What's love got to do with it? (laughs) 
This love is how we are recognized. Jesus says this, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let me read that again. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's, it's the basic public truth that we declare, says N.T. Wright. When the world sees it, it will recognize it as the genuine article. When we express and show and commit ourselves, impoverish ourselves, as Packer said, in love for one another, as Jesus did for us, people will know. As the old song says, they will know that we are Christians by our love. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in harmony, for there the Lord has bestowed the blessing of life forevermore, says the psalmist. And the world has its own perception and broken understanding of love. It's fragmented, it's disjointed. Love is broken in this world. And, and so you have all these rock artists that come up with their song titles about love because they see this love being broken. Love bites, love stinks. <laughs> love is a battlefield. And yet not so in the Christ-centered, rooted community, in Christian marriages, and in Christian households, and parenting, and how we care for elders, and how we care for those in need, and how we care for the abandoned, the widowed, the orphaned, in the Christian community, in our root, roots groups, we are to continually press on in love, extending kindness, building each other up, and so we are to ask ourselves, is my love expressed in this community? Am I expressing love? And how can I best express love? Is it through words? Is it through giving? Is it through hospitality? Is it through taking time to listen, the gift of time? Lord, is there a person today that needs me to be there for them? Lord, is there a person today that needs my help. And Lord, help me to express love, to be loving and kind, even to those who treat me carelessly and rudely. That's what we are to be in our roots community. You will be asked and encouraged to be in these groups to get to know one another. And it won't be frictionless. <laughs> it's, there will be difficult times, I'm sure. Just as you may have experienced difficult times and as you get closer and closer to people in your family. And yet Jesus calls us to go as he did. And to love to be patient and forbearing and to forgive and express compassion and kindness. Kristen and Keith Getty write this modern day hymn and they say this, Oh, how good it is when the family of God dwells together in spirit, in faith, and unity. Where the bonds of peace, of acceptance and love are the fruit of his presence here among us. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live out his word, till the whole earth sees the Redeemer has come, for he dwells in the presence of his people. Oh, how good it is on this journey we share to rejoice with the happy and weep with those who mourn. For the weak find strength, the afflicted find grace when we offer the blessing of belonging. Oh, how good it is to embrace his command, to prefer one another, forgive as he forgives. When we live as one, we all share in the love of the Son with the Father and the Spirit. Let this be our lives at the orchard. Let us pray. Yes, Father, we need your help 
to live out your command that we might love one another as you have loved us, as Jesus has loved us, as the Spirit has loved us. Help us to participate as your image bearers, to take on this humanity that Christ has now defined in us to be one, no longer slave or Greek or Jew or Gentile, but that we are called from different places to be one and to love one another. For as we look into each other's eyes and we see who the other person is, that we may see you, an image bearer, and love as Jesus loved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. loved ones we're so glad that you joined us here online online worship at the orchard and we want to encourage you to subscribe to the orchard channel here on youtube for the latest videos and you can also follow our social media uh, for the latest updates and uh, importantly we invite you to join us again here online but also in person we have uh, two services on sunday mornings at 9 a.m and 11 a.m and we'd love to see you and uh, certainly have a chance to, uh, to minister to you, to pray with you, and to sing along with you the praises uh, to our Lord and King Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now as you seek to love one another as Christ has first loved you. Amen. Amen.